out also. And recording. So good morning to everyone following live. And uh, this is the third morning of the Fizz and Sparkle Retreat with Ajahn mm -hmm. Brown and myself, Ben Chanda. And it's Ajahn's turn to give a little Dhamma talk and then a guided meditation. So good morning, Ajahn. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, <laughs> good meditators. And welcome to this third day of our retreat, Fizzy and Sparkly. And for that third day, that sometimes that people have managed to get themselves uh, into the retreat schedule, things are starting to um, obviously, hopefully, become um, a little bit more comfortable for you. But sometimes people, as Ayachanda said, can easily get bored. And one of the reasons they get bored is because they don't know just how to develop that perception of, of delight and beauty in the mind. And this is one of the greatest things of meditation, that after a while, you start to, I mean, enjoy it, really enjoy it. I still recall the very first meditation I ever did was over in Cambridge in the university. And it was in 1969, I just joined the Buddhist Society in Cambridge. And a monk was just giving a five minute meditation. That's all, five minutes. There's nothing about mindfulness or anything. Mindfulness was not uh, considered special in those days in 1969, it was just meditation, becoming peaceful. And even just after five minutes, of just meditation, it felt good. That's all I could say about it. It felt wonderful. And I thought, oh, this is really nice and easy and, and beautiful. Why not do some more of it? And so you started doing some more of it. But then after a while, I remember one or two years, that I started, oh, yeah, I've been there, done that. It's quite boring, I thought. And I was doing less and less meditation. And it did happen. I was... You know, in a coffee shop somewhere. And I, to this day, I don't know where it was, whether it was in Europe or overseas. But anyway, in that coffee shop, I was having a cup of coffee, just being friendly with everybody. And the, the fellow I was just uh, sitting next to, he was from a Frenchman. We started talking about spirituality and then meditation. And then I said that I used to meditate really a lot in the old days, and that's what you talk about. You've only been meditating for a couple of years, you say in the old days. But uh, and then he said, why don't you carry on meditating now? I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, but there's other things that a young man could be doing. And that's what I was up to, in the usual young men pursuits. And then he told me, he said, well, why don't you at the end of every meditation just a, do a little comparison between how you were when you were started and how you are after the meditation. Only doing 30 or 40 minutes. And I decided to try that. And it was just wonderful advice. Because there I found that every medita meditation was really worthwhile. Even the ones I thought were not so good. They were still, after I just sat down and was, uh, I was in those days I was trying to meditate, trying to learn how to be peaceful. But no matter what happened, I was always more peaceful at the end of a, even a 30, 40 minute meditation. And that gave me the encouragement to keep on going. And I might like telling this story at the, this time of the retreat, because sometimes if you haven't done much meditation before, or even if you have done meditation before a lot, Sometimes you think, oh, well, it's not, not really getting anywhere. Maybe I could be using my time for something else. But no, just check how your meditation is actually progressing. And you always feel so much more peaceful, so much more happy after each meditation. You don't need to be a very skillful or deep meditator to know that. And that's also why <coughs> um, well, so many times, I'm just trying to think of one of the many stories. Like we have this little meditation group uh, in those old days when we could actually meet together uh, close to our monastery. And it was in a hospital in Armadale group. 
And there was one lady who came there one evening, and at the very end of the, the session, she told me, Ajahn Brahm, I never wanted to come to this meditation class this evening. Had a busy day at work, but my children, there were children running up eight or nine or something. My two children said, Mummy, are you going to meditation tonight? I said, no, I've had a busy day. I'm tired. Mummy, you must go to meditation tonight. Well, I don't feel like it. Mummy, you must go to meditation tonight. And of course, the mummy said, why? And the two children said with such sincerity, because, mummy, you're a much nicer mummy when you come back from meditation. And that really got to her because she never realized what it was doing to her. But the children could. If it really is something positive, you may not be able to see it yourself, but your relations and friends and even the people you work with, they do notice it very clearly. And so that gives you this encouragement, encouragement to keep on going and to allow the mind to become more and more still. Of course, one of the advantages of a longish retreat, and this is seven days, is that you have all the time uh, to, to uh, develop the mind. It doesn't mean you have to spend all the time sitting cross-legged and just doing some sort of uh, usual way of meditation. You do this and then you do that and then you do something else. A lot of time is just learning just how to be peaceful. What is peaceful? And that's one of the reasons why that I often introduce that you know, you're by yourselves on this retreat, but many of you, I'm sure, have some very beautiful places you can just go to, you know, even just even looking out through a window, and just seeing the snow on the ground, or seeing the clouds in the tree, clouds in the sky, or seeing the night sky, places where it's quiet, peaceful, and it inspires you. Now that is an important part of meditation, to inspire oneself, to calm oneself. By calming oneself and inspiring oneself, you can find to so much peace and happiness. Especially, I meant those words intentionally to go together, peace and happiness. And that just, it feeds the mind. Often, sometimes, Ajahn Chah would teach me this. He would say that uh, just like the body needs uh, food to stay healthy, your mind just does need uh, peace and kindness, needs meditation to stay healthy. And that's what reminds me of uh, the story behind this, that I was there at the time when <coughs> a professor from Sweden, from one of the universities in Stockholm, came and many uh, great teachers in Asia, not just in Thailand, in Burma, in Sri Lanka, in India, because he'd heard, or rather the government had heard about meditation. And the government in Sweden wanted to find out what does meditation mean? What is meditation? And so the government sponsored this professor to go to every famous meditation teacher he could find you know, in Asia and ask them the same four questions. And those four questions were, what is meditation? Why do you meditate? How do you meditate? And what do you get out of meditation? And he'd ask some very, very famous gurus and teachers these questions. And now he'd come to Wat Ba Pog in Northeast Thailand to ask Ajahn Chah. And because he was representing the Swedish government, Ajahn Chah received him you know, with great respect and had to have a translator translate these questions into Thai. And when Ajahn Chah realized this was from the Swedish government and they understood what the questions were, Ajahn Chah asked for a piece of paper and a pen. And again, this is the first time we'd ever seen Ajahn Chah 
get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, I think it was, to answer these questions. And he was an actor in that sense that we knew that something interesting was going to happen. And of course it did. And he wrote down the answers so in Thai, in pencil, gave it to the translator. And of course the translator read them, waited about five minutes laughing, and then translated the questions uh, into English because the professor could understand English. And the translator said, your answer to the first question. So what is meditation? The great master Ajahn Chah's answer is, what is eating? Second question, <laughs> how do you meditate? His answer is, how do you eat? <laughs> why do you meditate? The answer is, why do you eat? The fourth question, what do you get out of, of meditation? The answer is, what do you get out of eating? And the professor was really upset. He said, I can't take that back to my government. And Ajahn Chah was very, very stubborn. He said, well, that's what I'm giving you. Take it or leave it. But afterwards, it was a beautiful, simple way of us answering a very deep question. And what is meditation? Why do you meditate? How do you meditate? What do you get out of meditating? And answering it with, what is eating? Eating is getting enough energy and health for your body so that your body can uh, perform, it can live, and it can do many services to your friends, family, loved ones, and to society. You can actually do something good in this world. That's why we eat. So why do we meditate? Same thing. So we can really make a very good, powerful, soft impact on this world and have a much better way for people to behave together. And uh, someone just told me this story yesterday. It was very Mumudu told me this story. It's a lovely little story that one of his friends was, um, she was uh, taking her two children uh, to McDonald's to give them a treat. And then she saw a group of indigenous young kids and they were being chased by some bigger kids who had some sticks. They were really going to give them a beating or something. I'm not sure why. But the two kids, you know, who were being chased, uh, dived under this uh, woman's car, right underneath it, to hide. And so she had to face these other four bigger kids who had sticks. And <coughs> she was really scared because, you know, the big kids, and she could really get... Um, uh, into big trouble. But instead she said, okay, I'm going into McDonald's to get something to eat. Do you want to come too? I'll give you a happy meal each. I'll pay for it all. And the just kids, hmm, what is really better? To, you know, to chase each other and beat each other up or to just to go and get a happy meal? And they all agreed, yeah, happy meal is much better. So they all went in with McDonald's, a whole group of them, and she paid a happy meal for them. And that meant there was no violence, and they all got on together afterwards. Simple pieces of wisdom like generosity and kindness and non-discrimination for all. It was a wonderful thing. And so she actually solved a very difficult problem there, which could have been very violent and very, very dangerous for everybody. But anyway, that's what meditation the spirituality of meditation does it does create a happier more peaceful world which is one of the wonderful things why we do it so you see it's benefit for you and for all the people you live with and number two it's you know, how do you meditate how do you eat does anyone ever told you how to eat yeah we've got manners you know just you know so we we don't slurp our tea <laughs> we don't so burp but you know the older you get the harder it is not to burp sometimes <laughs> so, <laughs> it's true anyway so you always uh, have the okay please forgive me or i apologize or something but then 
how do you meditate? Are all your meditations going to be great? Of course not. But we do it the best we possibly can. And we also have a little bit of, of etiquette for meditation. So the etiquette for meditation, if you do have digestive problems, as I say to people when they meditate in a hall together, I say, please, if you do have wind, you've ate too many baked beans, please don't sit in the middle of the hall or the front of the hall. Sit at the back with your back to the wall. <laughs> Otherwise, you might asphyxiate many of the other people <laughs> who are right behind you. <laughs> but no, the etiquette of meditation is etiquette with your body. Don't abuse your body. Don't force the body. Don't sort of decide you have to beat your personal best. That's not what we meditate for. It's not to actually increase our sense of, of achievement, to increase our ego. It is to disappear. So the reason why we eat is so the hunger disappears. So the feelings that you need some more energy inside just disappear, vanish. You don't eat the food which is going to um, upset your tummy. That's counterproductive. So little by little, we learn just how not to meditate in a way which upsets our mind or upsets our body. So little by little, we know how to meditate. What do we get out of meditation? What's the purpose of it? And of course, it is a healthy body is why we eat food. It's a healthy mind is why we meditate. And after a while, if you stop meditating, you find that the mind is like missing something. It's like hungry. It's like deprived. And you make too many mistakes. And you get sort of sucked into the difficulties of life. And you can't sort of let go of them and see them in perspective. Little by little, you find the more you meditate, the more healthy your spirituality is. It's food for the heart, food for the mind. And you can feel that. that <laughs> I often have other many, many other things to do in my life. Here, I'm just spiritual director of so many stuff, way too many. But what I do, whenever you have to do many, many things all at the same time, that you learn how to meditate, to let go, and to energize the mind, to give it some joy and happiness. And of course, I've been doing this for such a long time, I know how to do it, which means that I can always get some energy at any time which you really need it, and to really do you know, the best job I possibly can, to spiritually empower the mind, to make it really healthy. Just like an athlete who's performing at the Olympic Games or something, that they can learn just how to do their very, very best for their country by, by having a good state of mind and also learning how to meditate. Or even, and this is a simile which is you know, very easy to understand, and it's a great stimuli for meditation, but just how it relates to our, our ordinary daily life. And that is a time when I had a lot of stress as a young man because of exams at university. And I love telling this story, not just because how powerful it worked for me, but also just how it relates you know, to meditation, to your real life and the life of your friends and your family. And that was the time doing final examinations in theoretical physics. And in those days, in those days, the university, that everything went down to the final set of exams. Everything else you'd done in the whole three years counted for nothing. Just one set of exams. You passed, you failed, you did extremely well or not well at all, all due to one set of exams. That's why they call them the final exams. And in natural science, as I remember in those days, there were uh, six exams. Sorry, there were 12 exams over six days. Three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in a row. I thought that was gross. Now, that amount of stress doing it all together, and it was very uh, emotionally hard. So anyway, so I had the advantage because I knew how to meditate. So what I did every day, instead of having lunch, 
I had dinner in those days and breakfast, of course. Nice big breakfast, a nice big dinner in the evening. And at lunchtime, I just went to my room, sat on a seat uh, on the floor and just crossed my legs and meditated for half an hour. And this is actually what happened. I remember almost every day was the same. You sit down and the first thing you'd notice was you were started thinking of the past. And the past for me at that time was the morning exam. Did I answer all the questions correctly on uh, fundamental particle physics? Really fun subject, actually it was very fun. And I'm just gonna go off on a tangent here. I love going off on tangents because I don't plan my talks as you know. And the tangent was that fundamental particle physics, why was we really concerned about fundamental particles, about how stuff is made up? because the idea actually came from the Greeks. They wanted to find out the fundamental particle which makes up everything in this world. And they gave that a name, atom, which was you know, come from a Greek word meaning indivisible, you can't split it up. So the fundamental particle. But of course, the atom was split by Rutherford, uh, a New Zealand man working in Cambridge, and that was a really big thing that you could actually split the atom and realize that the atom was not the fundamental particle from which everything was made up. But of course, that he wasn't the first person to split the atom because the atom is very closely connected, I reckon. No one's actually disproved this yet. If you can, great, I must stop talking about it. But there's another word very similar called the Atma. <laughs> and what does that mean? That's from the India. That's the indivisible, the essence of the human mind or the soul or whatever they wish to call it. And is that really the fundamental particle which makes up our inner world, our spiritual life, the Atma? And of course, there was somebody who split that up way before Rutherford. He split it up 2,500 years ago, and that was the Buddha. Split it up into candles. These uh, parts of existence, what I call the components of existence, body, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana. So there's something similar there. That's why I like the idea of fundamental particle physics, but instead of particles in the mind, and this thing which, which you, your will and your consciousness is, and what are they? What's the fundamental part of you? And anyway, so doing that exam in the morning, <laughs> at lunchtime, you know, I started thinking, did I do things right? Did I answer the questions correctly? And what a complete waste of time that is. The exam paper is in, you cannot change it. Good, bad, it's done. You just got to accept it. And also I realized I was wasting energy. I had another exam coming in quantum physics in the afternoon. And so I needed to keep my mind energized. So I let go of the past. The next thing I noticed was the future. My afternoon exam in quantum physics or something, have I done enough? Um, research enough, uh, revision, should I pick up the books and learn a bit more? But I said, no, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to energize my mind. I have my knowledge, experience was enough. Now I need to be still to get some energy and clarity back into my brain. So I let go of the future. It wasn't that hard to do. For me, the future, it was the afternoon exam. The past was the morning exam because they were the most vital parts of my day. And so I could let them go. And the next thing I noticed that I was shaking. Now that's, I'm not normally a, a nervous person. But that day, I was very nervous to point my hands and body were shaking. And I never realized it. 
before because I was just too worried about the past or the future. But now I can see it, it's not quite easy just to relax the body. When you're mindful of this body, you know that kindness works and you can relax it. Come on, just no worries at the moment. Just had a drink. Once you relax the body, then that calmed down. The last thing I noticed was the dullness in my brain. It was like, as I wrote, I think, in a book, it was like a simile, like having a tea bag. You've already used it, and that's all you've got left to make your second cup of tea, an old used tea bag with all the oomph taken out. And that's what my brain felt like. For three hours of doing maths, doing sums, and now I had another exam coming up soon. But I also noticed that when you know you are aware of the problem and just stay with it and be kind to it, the energy comes back into your brain. I was actually re-energizing myself. I did that every lunchtime, simple meditation. Let go of the past, let go of the future, be aware of your body, relax it, and then go into the mind and just stay with it and see the energy come back again. Which meant when I came out, it's only half an hour, that's all the time I had. When I came out after half an hour, I was relaxed, not worried and energized. And this is no exaggeration in the, uh, after the exams, not beforehand, when the exams were finished, some of my friends came up and they said that I was the only student who went into the exam rooms smiling. They thought I was cheating. I said, I was not cheating. I just knew how to do exams. And I've taught that so often to so many other schools, even recently. I taught that method to uh, the, the Jewish school here in Perth before they did their university entrance exams. And I got a lovely letter afterwards from the, <laughs> this is no exaggeration, I got a lovely letter from the principal of the Jewish school. So thank you very much for teaching our kids how to pass the exams because that year their school came top of the rankings in the whole of Western Australia. Now that's a simple thing that when we have a anxious moment, we have a test or an interview or doing some exam for something or other, learning how to let go of the past and let go of the future, see our body and relax our body so it's not shaking, it's not tense, it's not tight, and then going into our mind and learning how to relax that. It creates so much stillness and clarity and joy. I was smiling naturally. I wasn't doing that on purpose. It was just what happens. So this is actually why we meditate and how we meditate. How do you eat? Again, we do have the, uh, the cultural the cultural sort of uh, etiquette of eating, but how we eat is a natural thing. How much we eat, and people say, how long should you how long should you meditate for every day? And the answer is, how long should you eat every day? Very similar. How much spiritual energy do you need? And do you want some more? So then, just meditate some more. And your posture when you're eating. I was always taught when I was young, you sit at the table to eat. But then started sitting on the sofa to watch the TV or listen to something. And these days people eat all over the place, any old posture, as long as they're comfortable, as long as they can digest well. And little by little, we chew mindfully. And actually we could feel the food in our mouth and we can then actually digest it. Sometimes, and I tell this to people, if you go out with someone to a nice restaurant, please, when you get your food, please tell them to be quiet, not to talk when you're eating, because the food is delicious. Somebody spent a lot of time cooking that food for you. 
And so you want to just enjoy it as much as possible. And if they're talking to you, you know, you're not aware of what you're putting in your mouth and in your tummy. <coughs> so if you've got someone who always likes talking a lot when you go out with them for, for lunch or for dinner, just go to a rubbish fast food restaurant because it doesn't matter what you're putting in your mouth, you can't even taste it. But if it's a nice restaurant, tell them to be quiet so you can really enjoy it. And of course, that becomes part of our meditation practice. Now, you're on a retreat now. Many of you by yourself, even if you have somebody with you on this retreat, please be quiet when you're, you're eating so you can really taste the food. It's amazing what happens. I always like telling people that after I did a nine-day retreat, I think I did a personal nine-day retreat here, just went into my cave and just stayed there and people bought me some food every now and again. But I remember once that retreat was over, then breakfast time, first time off the retreat, and then somebody gave me some baked beans for breakfast. I remember you were just so refined, your awareness was so strong. I just put one, honestly, a single baked bean in my mouth. It's not very big. And the taste was incredible. I just put it in there, close my eyes, and just you know the combinations, only a single baked bean, tiny. You know, from the tomato sauce, which was on the top, you know, the sweetness of the tomato, its saltiness, its texture, its flavor, you could taste everything. And that was like a, a five-star chef had made that baked bean, even though it just come from a cat and just been eaten up. And nevertheless, you could taste so much of that. It was incredible, it was so joyful. And then this is why that when we start meditating and extending that meditation to other things we're doing during this retreat, it really takes off and you start to enjoy it to the max. A couple of days ago, I did say something about walking meditation, but I didn't really go into it so that fully. I think I want to say a few words about it now. When you're doing the walking meditation in your room, not just sitting, you find a nice space. Now, in those old days, I used to spend some time in hotels all over the world, you know, teaching retreats, giving talks and places. And the hotels were great because they had an air con, I could get the right temperature. And just the design of you know, the ordinary hotel rooms was so much the same. You know, the front door and you have the, uh, the toilets and showers, uh, room and then you go a bit, bit deeper into the room when you get your bed and then you go to the end of the room you get the window but that was a long enough to do a meditation path from the front door to the end of the room and back again not that long but long enough to really get some really nice meditation coming up again you uh, don't go thinking about things you want to feel your your sensation of your feet on the carpet or on the tiles, whatever you have there. And uh, hands in front or behind doesn't really matter as long as you don't keep moving them. And you start uh, feeling the sensations in your feet. What is it like just to move one foot? Even right now, you've got your eyes closed, great. If you're looking at the screen, that's okay too. Lift one foot, lift your left foot up. Right now, what does that feel like? And hold it while it's up. Now very gently, put it back down on the floor. How did that feel? You're becoming aware of sensations in your body, in the lower body. Just probably, you know, from the, maybe the bottom of the thighs, the knees, and the, uh, the calves and the feet themselves you get to know what it feels like. So when you're doing the walking meditation, that's what you do. You're just aware of the movement of the legs as you do one step. You don't deliberately do it fast or deliberately do it slow, but it's for most people, it's quite natural. But once you start to becoming aware of the movement of the feet, there is so much going on there. Like I could see so many different flavors just in one baked bean. 
and they were all incredible. You can feel so many different movements of just one left leg as it starts to walk. Hundreds of them, thousands of them. And the story I like saying, because this is one of the best times I did walking meditation, when I was just a young monk in that room where we just do walking meditation, half an hour to do about 15 meters, half an hour to do 15 meters, one five, coming back again. And I knew that it was half an hour each because I don't know why they do this in big halls in Thailand. They had a grandfather clock which chimed every quarter hour. <laughs> so it was noisy, but I didn't mind that. But nevertheless, I remember just doing this once and going so slow, being so into the meditation. And that was the story when I'd forgotten that I was supposed to go to some ceremony. And so this monk was sent to come and get me. And now it's easy to get somebody who's asleep and wake them up and get them to go to something, or you know, if they're reading or something, but you try to get somebody out of meditation, it's a difficult thing to, to get their attention. Because when I was doing, my eyes were down on the ground. I'm looking at the ground, two meters in front of me. I was just lifting a foot and there was so much going on there. It was totally filling my mind with all these amazing sensations. And when they asked, I could hear, it was like in a distance. Brahma Wang So, Brahma Wang So, like someone calling him from about 20 meters away. But then I realized they weren't 20 meters away, they were almost shouting in my ear. But that's what it felt like when you're getting still in meditation. All that sound was just going a long way away from you. And I realized. I better come out of the walking meditation. I've got some duties to do. But it was so difficult with all the greatest respect in the world, to, you know, as a senior monk and you know, realizing I was at fault. I had to move my head. And just to move your head from looking at the floor to turning to the right and looking at the person before you spoke to them. There's so many different muscles in the neck and the rest of the body, which had to move to actually to turn your head around. And it was fascinating. It took me about two or three minutes just to turn my head around. I, was, I just couldn't do anything quicker. It was just you were in sort of uh, the first gear and you just couldn't move that first gear up to second, third or fourth all that easily. And when I did meet his eyes and turn around, What? <laughs> That's like a stupid fellow, but because the people knew what meditation does to you, they understood. And so we have to go to a dining he said. And I started getting my body and mind to work a bit faster. That's what happens. But even walking meditation is so beautiful, so wonderful. Sounds like thousands of miles away. You're in this body. And then if you wanted to, uh, to use that stillness and that joy, that enjoyment of you know, being still, then you can just sit down if you wish and take that meditation even further and deeper. The walking and sitting, sitting and walking, or even if you want to lie down, lie down in a position where you don't usually fall asleep. Because your body is now really comfortable. And then just, Make sure the body is at ease, like I've been doing in the guided meditations. And then go into silence, stillness, present moment. When the breath comes to you, the nice thing is you're enjoying all of this. You're enjoying it so much, it does become effortless. Effort destroys joy. Effort and striving is I'm going to give up happiness now. It's going to come later on, you hope. But the best joy comes when you relax to the max. You're in this moment. You don't want everything in the whole world. You're just watching a foot rise up. You're just watching the silence inside. You're not choosing what you're watching. But you're fully aware. 
and the body gets so at peace, it starts to vanish. And the mind is also at peace. It doesn't want anything. It's like you're going on this great expedition to a beautiful forest. You don't know what it means. You don't need to know what it means. You're enjoying every moment of it. You're discovering. We're going into just the caves. That's why I always used to like caves. Remember one really big cave over in Malaysia. There's quite a few of them which I went into. And it was like going into your mind. There's beautiful um, limestone edifices and waterfalls, and it was quiet. And I loved those things because they were simple, restrained. You couldn't see far distances because you're in the opposite direction. You're looking inwards, inwards and inwards and inwards. And then you find some beautiful formations. And then when you do that, you have so much fun and joy. And so meditation becomes a great exploration of your inner world and the inner world of others as well. Because they're the same. Little by little, the deeper you go, the less difference there is between us. The mind has got no gender. It's like neutral, but it's beyond gender. That's why I'm not talking about the brain, we're talking about the mind. It isn't even not even a human being, the mind, shared by heavenly beings and everything else. This mind, when you really get to know it, becomes delightful. They call it Prabhasa Rajita, the radiant mind. And then after a while, the radiant mind gets so soft, it too disappears. Freedom. Wow. That's why we eat, that's why we meditate, to be free. Anyway, that's a little talk on how to eat, <laughs> how to eat meditation. I never think I'm going to talk about all sorts of stuff. I hope, to, hope it's useful. In the afternoon talks, of, yeah, for you, in the suta classes, that's when I get a bit more formal. So you describe how the Buddha taught meditation. Well, those are little things there. Inspiration and joy. And please understand that the meditation is a natural process. You don't have to do things. Just get out of the way. And let it happen. Okay. So now we have the toilet break. For those who want to go to a toilet, let him go. And for five minutes, and after the five minutes, then we do the Guided meditation. Okay. Excellent. Oh. So is that the sort of stuff which people don't mind hearing? My agenda? I'm sure that it's very useful. <laughs> okay. I know it's so uh, hopefully it's the way it's put together, which is responding to the moment. Yeah. And interesting what you said about the uh, when you sit with people, even on Zoom, I'm on the other side of the world, still there's a connection there. And it's one of the things which a few young people were talking to me about last weekend. They said, well, when you talk to us, it's as if you know you're just talking to me, that you know you can understand us. How on earth do you do that? Mm. I said, because I don't plan any talk. So I just shut up and let the sort of talk evolve. And that's the only way that you have a chance of connecting to people. And it's also later on that when you have that confidence, which I have, then you can then give all sorts of talks any old time. I mean, you don't know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> and it also means that I enjoy listening to my talks. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I... it's inspiring. So, wow, what did you just say? Where did that come from? That was amazing. <laughs> Honestly, that's how I feel sometimes. 
Yeah, I think it's something about connecting to that universality of the Dhamma, you know, just the basic oh, yeah. principles that are the same for everyone. Because if, if you know your mind so thoroughly, then mm. in a sense, you know everyone else's mind, isn't it? Yeah, we don't read minds. Sure. Don't ever sort of be afraid of monks reading your mind because I often tell people if you read one or two minds, you never want to read a mind again. <laughs> it's, it's rubbish. <laughs> Honestly, are your minds really ready to be read? Ah, please don't read my mind. Ah, I'm thinking wrong things. Ah. <laughs> but anyway, that's another sort of part of the Dhamma. Actually, I really appreciate that because I find, Ajahn, that it has a certain um, amount of respect and ethics around it. You know, that you don't invade people. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But every now and again, you just let somebody in. If it's an Ajahn Shah, they're coming up a look. And when you've, you've cleaned everything up and it's so nice and, and clean and bright. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, so someone wrote in the comments, very, very useful in, um, in response to your question, Ajahn. So. Very good. And even if it's not, it might be, you, it might be later. You never know, right? How useful that's, these things are. That's a smart person who said that. I say that because I thought Ajahn Chah was just really just uh, not uh, addressing the Dhamma properly when he was young. Right. Saying stuff which was, made no sense at all. And then later on, you realize just how powerful those teachings were. Exactly. Seeds which were planted in you and just they were dormant for many years until it was important mm -hmm. and then it just came up by themselves it's also incredible that the dhamma like you can give a general dhamma talk and it can i don't know cover various themes but somebody always gets something out of it yeah like maybe not everything but each person will take something that's important for them yeah, it's and sometimes it's works. two completely different talks to do two different. <laughs> yeah, that is true, and it's sometimes that it's so important to get that inf not just information, but that way of looking, mm -hmm. so that you can go through problems and with greater ease. And once you get through those problems and those difficulties, ah, what a gift that is—the gift of the Dharma. Not learning more so you could write books or win conversations at coffee table debates, but so that your whole life becomes so much more peaceful and happy. Mm -hmm. Just you know that story I said of that fellow who had the, uh, the brain tumor, and he came and told me about a week or two ago that he didn't need sort of the operation anymore, mm -hmm. that his meditation and sort of got his brain tumor to disappear. So it was his birthday today, he came to the temple. Oh. Very nice to see him. That's great. Yeah. And that's just meditating. It's incredible powerful what it can do. Yeah. Anyway, that just I thought I'd share that because I made me very happy to see him today. Oh. Okay, one more comment came in and then we'll sit. Yeah. Um, not just useful, but very full of love and warmth. That's very nice. Yeah. That sounds the sort of uh, comment they give to your talks <laughs> as well. <laughs> Love of what? Why can't more monks and nuns be like that? Why do you have to, this is what you should be done, and don't do that, don't sit this way, and don't sit that way, and, and sit more quiet, and don't. <laughs> I could never understand that. Even like the, <laughs> when you had the Zen master coming behind you and hitting you on the back. What are you doing that for? You don't know this story. I can't resist it. Here it comes. This was when, <laughs> when I, you know, I used to go to Hong Kong a lot. So, you know, I'd still go there if it was, the borders were open. But anyway, that it was a great place to go because there was they had some Chinese monks coming in, and monks, many people were were in transit. And I got all the gossip, of what was happening in mainland China with Buddhism. And this one monk said, "Oh yeah, you know, there's." mainland Chinese Buddhists, they're going on retreats now, Malay people, and there was this one lady, 
she was on a retreat. A middle-aged lady, obviously, you know, had a lot of confidence and must be reasonably wealthy. And so during the retreat, the first day of the retreat, she was a bit sleepy. And so the Zen master hit her on the back with the Zen stick. You know what she did? She got out a mobile phone, turned it on, and rang the police. <laughs> and the Chinese police came to the temple, and they arrested that man. They took him away. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that in China anymore. Hit <laughs> people. <laughs> it's even though it's tradition. <laughs> and I, I, I must admit, I, must, I don't know why I do this. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> Poor old monk. I don't know what happened to him, but anyway. <laughs> Traditions so change. Big, traditions <laughs> change. You have to change with them sometimes. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd share that story with you, Paul. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why it's good to make sure people don't have mobile phones during your retreat. Oh, oh, use I, do, stick. I do have one, Ajahn. Be careful. <laughs> ah! Ah. But this is for teaching purposes. No one else should okay, have one. Okay, very good. Okay. <laughs> so I am being a bit of a hypocrite, but anyway, I'm excited. No, no, there's teachers, yeah. It's for, <laughs> for helping people. Yeah. Anyway, okay, let's get some meditation underway. Okay, so we're doing the guided meditation for who was only 35 minutes. Oh, I'm going to go right till, till the uh, well, till 10 o'clock. That's right, isn't it? I'm sure we don't mind if you go over either. Okay, yeah, I don't mind either. Here we go. So you sit down. Uh, close your eyes. When you close your eyes to the world, don't close it to the joy of what you're doing now. I think of this is beautiful thing. I'm just thinking of a beautiful thing like one baked bean. And just how delicious it was. It's not for food or indulgence, it's just how wonderful this mind can be. You can see joy and happiness in so many things. It's only in this moment right now. The past, I don't know why that so many people pick up the faults of the past. It's a beautiful stuff in the past as well. And for the future, I'm going to let that happen. I'm not going to sort of like I used to do with like adventure books as a kid, look at the final chapter and find out who was responsible, who did it, what the, the end result is. Let just the past unfold. So I let the past, yeah, let the past fold up, and let the future unfold. Because right now, what we all need is to rest in this moment. I'm going to do this meditation slightly differently, just you know, for interest, just like how you face exams and how you make your mind so powerful to do well and you enjoy it. So all your past, no matter what it was, Sometimes you can't trust your memory of the past. You have arguments about it because it's well known by psychology. The way we remember things, we just remember the last time we remembered it. And every time we remember this whole series of times, we change it slightly. Just like in the old game I used to play in the school ground of Chinese whispers. I don't know why they call it Chinese whispers whole line of kids, you say one thing to the first kid, and they'd repeat it to the next kid, and repeat it to the next one, and when it came to the very end, it was totally different. And the classic case of that was in the First World War, where the general told the lieutenant general, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. By the time it went down the chain of command from one officer to a junior officer. When it got to the actually the soldiers supposed to be doing this, what they heard was send, not reinforcements, but three and four pence of British currency. Not we're going to advance, we're going to a dance. That's what happens with memories, so similar. 
It's untrustworthy. So don't worry what happened in the past. What happened in the morning? Yesterday? The day before? Let that all just be uncertain. That's for the future. Now is where your future is being made. This is the only time you have. And the best way of creating a really good, wonderful future is to be here, right now. So right now, how do you feel? How's your body right now? Does it need adjusting? You can do the normal, how's your feet? How's your bottom, your back? I like to go slowly through my body because there's so much going on there. And it's important and I, I do care for my body. I wanna make sure it's healthy. Believe it or not, that I am a very healthy monk. I haven't been sick for years. Your feet on the floor. All right, just get into this. Feel all the sensations right now. They're not unpleasant, they're not so sensuous, they're just peaceful and interesting. And the longer you have this mindfulness and care, they say simple things like the sensation of your feet on the floor, the more your mindfulness grows. You're enjoying this, at least I am. And that means that the awareness is like the lights go up in the room. You see more. What you see is enjoyable, fulfilling. I go up my legs. Today I can feel just the, the muscles in the back of my legs. My knees are just like, never any problem. Amazing. I used to play sport, but I was always soft playing sport. My thighs and my butt, my back. Yeah, my back, it, it's like it's asking me, can you please stretch me? I do that. I'm kind to my body. I look upon my body as a friend, like a companion. So I always make sure that my body is well looked after. As best I can. <laughs> the front of my body, all these organs, my stomach and my intestines. There's always a sensitive part for a monk because sometimes we don't know what we eat. Sometimes you know, ask people, you know, what's in this? <laughs> and even they don't know. <laughs> so there's a bit of a risk when monks eat, and nuns as well. I look at my tummy, it's, it's actually feels healthy today, which means it's nothing which is really oppressing my digestive system. You go up to your lungs and even your heart, if you can notice it. Just relaxing it, being kind to it. And up to the shoulders and the, the hands, and in between the two of them, the elbows and the arms.
I just did a big yawn there. I don't know why. I'm not tired. Because my body needed to do that for whatever reason. I trust my body. Let it do what it needs to do. And then I notice my neck. Also, I had an itchy nose. I just scratched it. Feel my face. I always like to finish on the face. Because there are some very subtle muscles. And knowing how to deal with them when they're tight or stretched or aching helps me deal with the emotional world. It's a nice segue, <coughs> a way of going into the mind. And I move my awareness to the whole body. This whole 70 year old body, which has looked after me so well, allowed me to meditate, to do walking meditation, sitting meditation, teaching, traveling, working. I've got a lot of gratitude to my body. May not be the best, but it's served me and others pretty well. With gratitude, there's always a sense of like a smile inside. An appreciation, a joy to your own body. That's what my body feels like, like, like right now. Peaceful, appreciated. I do linger there. The joy of relaxation, appreciation, the joy of peace. I make peace with my body. I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to try and train it, control it, make it something it's not. I'll, I open my door, of my, open the door of my heart to my body as it is. I notice it's a, my body is a bit hot because of the hot weather this afternoon in Perth. <coughs> a little burp there, excuse me. And then I go inside. Peace, how peaceful am I now? If you like, you don't have to do this. Give it a number from one to 10. One is really, 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 really peaceful. 10 is agitated. How do you feel now? Give it a number, just for yourself. And then also investigate what makes you more peaceful. How do you go deeper into the present moment and into the silence? A lot of time you don't do anything. You restrain, guard, renounce, let go of control, whatever's left, you let it be. It will look after itself, you have the confidence just to let things be, let the mind settle down. Not make the mind settle down, but to let it. How peaceful are you now from one to 10?
you get more agitated, it's obviously the wrong direction. Remember to be kind, happy to be here. Not trying, not training your mind, but being at peace and being kind to this mind. Kindness softens things. When it's soft, it's easy. The mind wants to be peaceful. So let it be. The mind goes deeper and deeper and deeper into this moment, into the silence. It happens to me naturally. I soon become aware of my breathing. Once the mindfulness is strong, breathing is, breathing is just there, it comes all by itself. I don't invite it in. I let it come in if it wants to. I don't really bother and care myself, I don't care. I'm saying that's not the right word. I'm not really interested in where the breath comes in or where it goes out or how long it is. I'm just really fascinated by however long it wants to come in, however long it wants to go out, how it feels. I never try to control my breathing. Comes in. comes in slowly, pauses, and then goes out again. It does it all by itself. I let go enough just to allow my body to breathe. I don't try to make it peaceful. If I try that, it just disturbs it. I just relax with it. Be a good friend. And the breath usually just gets peaceful by itself. The amazing thing is because I don't tell it what to do, it trusts me back. Just a metaphor. So my breath is with me. We're good friends. I'm not afraid of one another. We trust one another. My breath just stays. And now I'm describing this. Last couple of minutes, I haven't missed one breath. It's been with it. It's usually at this point, I just stop doing anything, stop giving instructions. I stay with my breath in the moment. It's enjoyable, peaceful. And this is good enough for me. I'm content, satisfied with just this. That contentment, that satisfaction. I know from so much experience that that is what's going to take me deeper. The best will soon become really delightful. I'm just watching, watching from a distance. Relaxing to the max. Letting things be and letting the natural process of meditation of stillness bring up this beautiful joy. I 
No, my job now is just to let it happen. How to do it? Just let it happen. I'm like a, a gardener who just lets the flowers blossom. Let's see the fruit form and it falls whatever it wishes. I don't tell it what to do. I can feel my breath. It's so beautiful. So, to see what happens next, I'm going to be quiet now.
feeling close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel? Like having had a good meal with the heart and inside. Gives you energy and the inner health, which is really important. Even getting beautiful joy coming up, happiness of a peaceful mind. Little by little, we learn. Not to do meditation, but to allow meditation to blossom, to flower, and to give its fruit to us. And all the beings we come across and meet with peace and smile. But please, at the end of three breaths from now, if you wish, you may open your eyes to end the meditation. Be another one coming soon. Thank you, body. Thank you, mind. Ah, that's nice. Okay. Any announcements? Anything to say? Okay, so now is yeah, lunchtime, break time, whatever you wish to do. And I'll see you later on. In another couple of hours time. Bye. <laughs> Very good.